Hello, everybody. This is Dr. Christina Fasonic. I am an English professor at California University of Pennsylvania. And today is day two of, and the final day, of the presentations for my students in English 499, which is our capstone course for English majors. And if you tuned in on Tuesday, you know that six students gave fantastic presentations, first with um, a little critical introduction to and a context for their work, and then um, read a brief passage from the work that they're turning in for their final projects for, that represents the work, the cumulative work of their undergraduate career in English. So. Today, we have six more um, students, and our first student up is Kennedy Johnston. Hi, Kennedy. Hi. How are you? I'm good, how are you? Are you ready to do this? I think so. Okay, I am going to disappear and let you do your thing. Okay, sweet, thanks. So um, my story, uh, what I did for my project, um, it's called Another Day, Another Double. Um, I originally started this project back in the fall of 2019 um, in a Dr. House creative writing class. And um, I wrote my story, turned it in, and I never looked at it ever again. Um, and then the capstone was in my future, so I needed to figure out what I was going to do for that. So I decided to take a look at that story, and um, it was a mess. <laughs> it needed a lot of work. Um, and I tried my hardest to revise it. And then um, when the semester came, I just decided to re completely rewrite it. So um, that's what I'm gonna share with you today. So basically um, I focused on this one book that was <clears throat> assigned as a textbook in Dr. House's advanced writing class this semester. Um, and it's called The Practice of Creating Writing by Heather Sellers. And um, basically, basically she gives you um, her elements for the craft of creating creative writing. And um, the things that I really focused on in my project were insight, energy, and revision. <laughs> and um, <clears throat> I'm a firm believer in um, writing about what you know, starting with what you know and your experiences. I feel like that's where you can really start writing solid stories because you don't have to do all, like a whole bunch of research if you already know a lot about it. Um, and that's where I started because I didn't know where I was I didn't know what else to do. <laughs> and that's actually a piece of advice that's in this book that I read throughout the semester. And um, I kind of took that and ran with it because I know a lot about um, the topic that I my story is about, which is the restaurant business. Um, I worked as a busser when I was 13. By the time I was 19, I had become a food runner, a hostess, and then I was a waitress from the time I was 16 till I was 20. Um, <clears throat> now at 21, I'm a chef and a manager of a restaurant, and um, I've gotten to see every single angle possible <laughs> in um, the restaurant business. And one thing that I really wanted to focus on was sexual harassment, um, which happens a lot, especially with younger waitresses. I see it now in my younger waitresses. Um, it happened to me when I was still a waitress, and I wasn't really able to step back and look at those experiences. And when I wrote my original story, a lot of the resentment I had for my job came out in my story and it just didn't really do it any justice. So now that I'm a manager and a chef and I'm able to take a step back from that, I'm no longer in that environment. Um, I was able to reflect on those experiences and actually create a solid story that reflects the things that I actually wanted to talk about when I originally thought of the idea. So, that is one way that my project is grounded in English studies is through all the craft that I did. And um, a lot of the energy, cause I never thought of energy being anything that had to do with um, writing. I didn't really know anything about that. But um, one advice was to vary the pace to sustain the energy. And I did that through cigarette breaks, which pulled my character out of the chaos of a dinner rush and let her breathe. So, and then of course, revision because I need to do a lot of work with my own writing. I really needed to um, buckle down and write a story that was worth everyone's time here today. So with that being said, I'm going to read you a little bit from my story called Another Day, Another Double. It was already a busy night being a Saturday and the second wave was about to hit. I walked to the hostess stand to check if there were any more reservations for the night. There were eight between seven and nine, leaving six tables open for walk-ins. 
That didn't really matter to me since my section was the bar tonight and Blue Oyster Bay was playing, a local band from Greensburg. Saturdays were everything here at Jelani's. We had live music at eight, a full reservation book, a packed bar, and not enough staff to accommodate. The bar section consisted of seven tables, two more than any other section in the restaurant, all of which were mine. I had nearly a full section for the majority of the day, finally clearing it up around 7.30. I stood at the end of the bar, bullshitting with the bartender, mostly about our boss, when the parking lot began filling up. Just then the band walked through the side door and asked where to set up. I directed them to the makeshift stage my boss put together in the corner of the bar and went back to the kitchen to tell the kitchen staff that we were about to get busy. I watched as the hostess sat the reservations first while directing others to find a seat in the bar area or wait to be seated in the dining room. <clears throat> five groups of four marched into my section, two of them being my regulars that come every weekend. Five tables, 20 waters, 20 orders, about 10 alcoholic beverages, and at least six appetizers. I walked to each table handing out menus, giving my short introduction that I give every table. Hi, my name is Sally. I'll be taking care of you tonight. Can I start you off with any drinks? We have Coke products, unsweetened iced tea, and lemonade. I also have a few IPAs on tap as well as Miller, Coors, and Yingling. First table, four waters, two cranberry vodkas, a 22-ounce Miller, and a 12-ounce Voodoo Atomic Pumpkin. Second table, three Jack and Cokes, a glass of Merlot, and an, and an order of fried calamari. By the time I had gotten back to the service station, I had six pages of drinks and appetizers. Everyone got at least two drinks, even if they got a Coke. They also had a water. One by one, I put each table's order in. I filled 20 waters, lined them on a tray, and head out to my tables. The bar is packed at this point, and the seats are filled, and, are, and there are people standing everywhere. But I see a slight parting that I can make it through. Balancing the tray of waters on my shoulders, I grabbed the closest tray stand and set down the tray. After quickly passing out the waters, I rushed to the bar to grab the other drinks and run to the back to get the sodas. Once the drinks are settled, I visit my tables for their orders. 20 orders, six substitutions, one peanut allergy, and one gluten allergy. My least favorite people are gluten people in the restaurant. I swear they only say it to feel part of something. Ding, 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 Sally, appetizers, tables four, six, seven, and eight, you're up. Ding, ding, Jesse yells from the hot window five feet away from where I was standing. I'll be there in a second, I got orders to put in. I yelled back while trying to finish my orders in the system without losing my place. And I got orders going out, ding, ding, let's go, he responds continuing to ring the bell, knowing it's the only thing that pisses me off. Jesse is one of our line cooks. He's a short, angry man who has struggled with alcoholism for probably his entire life. He's worn the same flat rim hat the past five years I've known him, ever since I began working here as a busser. His only job is to slap some mashed potatoes and vegetables on a plate once the real cooks finish the dish. He always says he takes pride in his presentation, which basically means sprinkling some dried parsley before putting the plate in the hot window. I, I rush through the remaining orders and get my food out of the window. First table, fried calamari. Second, loaded fries and cheese stick. Third, cheese platter and spinach dip. Last table, Bavarian pretzel. While my tables are occupied by their food, I make a break for the back door to have a much needed cigarette. The cool far fall air hits my face as I walk out the door, sending a chill down my spine. With a cigarette in my mouth, I search for a crate to sit on and light up. The first hit always sends a tingling through my body, ending in my fingertips and toes. I take long, slow pulls, bringing the smoke into my lungs and exhaling. Smoking, smoking is the only time I have to sit down during a shift, and this is only the third cigarette I've smoked since 10 this, this morning. The door creaks open and the hostess pops her head outside. You have another table, she says, three adults and a child. Taking one last pull off my cigarette, I stand up and walk back into the restaurant. As I walk past the kitchen window, Jesse yelled, don't take too long, your food's going to be up in a minute. I glared at him and walked out to my table. Same spiel, different people, more waters, beers, and appetizers. I could hear the ringing of the bell from the loud bar and Jesse obnoxiously yelling my name. All five of my table's or orders came out at the same time. I strategically placed as many plates as I could get on one tray. Eight plates, that's all I can fit on one tray. I balanced a tray on one shoulder and using my free hand, grab one more plate. Back through the crowded bar, I rushed to take the orders to my I rushed the orders to my tables, taking me three trips. Four more beers, three more waters, another Merlot. I ran to the kitchen to put my drink orders in and grab waters for my new table. We only have two computers and both are occupied. I ran to the six pack shop, cutting off my fellow wait waitress to get my order in and get to my tables. Normally I'd feel bad, but I will never feel bad for Trisha. She's been here the longest and she won't let you forget it. She's been missing a canine tooth ever since the second year that I worked here. I guess her boyfriend, husband, baby daddy, whatever he is, knocked it out one night during an argument at the bar. She's been in and out of rehab for the past six years, yet still has a job when she comes back. She only worked at Jelani's one year longer than me, but she acted like she was the boss, which makes sense since her and Jamie are BFFs and contain an equal amount of bitch in their system. 
Jamie always defended Trisha, saying she was visiting family after a month-long detox at St. Joseph's in Indiana. She stood behind me as I purposely took my time putting in my drink orders, despite not having much time to spare myself. If there's a chance for me to make Trisha's, Trisha's night worse, I always take it. As I turned to walk into the bar, her shoulder somehow met my chest, but I made sure to push back. I waited at the bar for my beers when I felt a gentle touch on my backside. I ignored it, thinking it was a mistake before that gentle touch became a game of grab ass. I reached back and snatched the hand of an at least six foot middle-aged man whose thinning black hair created a bald spot on the crown of his head. He was my customer, customer from my far table. One of those guys who says, can I get a side of you after, I, after you ask him for his order? Can I help you? I sarcastically asked the man, releasing his wrist. He leaned in towards me, gliding his hand down my cheek, asking, what do you say we meet up after your shift is over? Me and my boys are going out after this. With a smile on my face, fighting the urge to slap this man across his smug face, I responded with an awkward chuckle. I say I'd like to get these drinks, take care of my tables, and go home for a good night's sleep in my own bed. I turned away from him, making eye contact with the bartender. I lift my brow and at her and shake my head, singling for her to hurry it up. Meanwhile, the man continued to stand next to me, just staring, staring at me. I could see it out of the corner of my eye. Finally, he walked away, and I watched him make his way back to his table. So that's all I have for you right now, but um, I hope you enjoyed. Thank you so much for that. Um, absolutely excellent work. And I know that anybody who has ever worked in food service knows the truth of your narrative. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you so much, Kennedy. I really appreciate it. You have some applause from someone named Starless Midnight. Thank you. <laughs> And Dr. Taylor also has a comment for you saying nice. He's good for the niceness. <laughs> you. And Noah uh, says, uh, great illustration of the hustle and bustle of the restaurant business and love the vivid descriptions of the varied characters. Absolutely. Did a great job. Thank you. I appreciate that. All right. Thank you. So up next we have Sierra. Hello, Sierra. You you were just saying that you were about to get a new job, right? Yeah, um, doing waitress work. Yeah, yeah. That, that, that's why I thought I'd bring it up. <laughs> yeah, no, nothing I'm not accustomed to already, though. I've worked in food service for a few years. <laughs> yes, yes. I think that that is the lot, your lot in life for a while. It's, it's hard work that I think people who have never done it have no clue. Um, so what are you going to present to us today? So I'm going to be discussing my survivor narrative called Forged by Fire. Yes, and I know you've been working on this, and this is actually going to be part of a much larger project as you continue working on it, right? Yes. Um, it should be over 100 pages, maybe even 200 by the time it's like legitimately finished and ready for publication. But as of right now, I only have 20 pages. Yes, and I, I'm I'm really actually proud of you for taking the time necessary to to be ethical and uh, to represent these stories uh, and give them the attention that they need. So I'm going to step away or disappear, or whatever you do virtually, and I'll see you in a few minutes. Hi, everyone. So I am an English literature major, but today I'm presenting you a creative writing piece. Uh, I have a minor in creative writing and um, I'm just gonna hop right in. So my critical intro begins with an epigraph by Virginia, Virginia Woolf. And it says, who shall measure the heat and violence of the poet's heart when caught entangled in a woman's body? From her book, A Room of One's Own, um, I have included this because uh, she contends that, you know, what if Shakespeare had a sister and she was just as brilliant as he, but she wasn't recognized because of her gender. And um, I put this at the very beginning because I want to have readers know right off the bat that my story is representative of woman, the woman identity and how she veers through life dealing with um, her identity surrounding oppression. 
Um, I want to reframe this cultural identity surrounding oppression and trauma attribution. So the main focus of my work is language and how um, it is used as a vehicle in understanding social discourse and our own traumas. Um, I think it's this is really valuable work in the context of English studies because I feel like there aren't enough stories about it. There are plenty of people who have experienced debilitating traumatic events who don't have an outlet or you know, books, anything to, to really understand that there is hope after something like that happens to you. So language and phrasing, as I said before, is really important to my project. And I drew a lot of my theoretical approaches from Roland Barthes, uh, Brian Richardson, and uh, Mickey Ball. So Roland Barthes contends in their intro to structural analysis of narrative that um, there has never been anywhere, any time where people have not been telling stories. And it's a very humanistic trait. However, there are people shoved to the back because, um, you know, their identity is not, um, I guess, of value to the culture. And so narratology is based in structuralism. And I learned that in a class that I had with Dr. Vanderlaan. And essentially, uh, Mickey Ball goes into talking about um, structuralism and how it's based in the dialogic principle from which I gathered a lot of my inspiration. And Ball writes about the language philosopher, uh, Mickey Bachton, and um, how we basically express that there's limited importance of the individual, an author, and um, any text is a patchwork of a different strata, uh, bearing traces of different communities and constellations between them, essentially saying that meaning is evolved through um, these interactions between the author, reader, and whatnot, and that is really important to my project because um, I I want people to take what they need from my work. I don't I don't want them to read it and think this is just how it is. And um, I was I was really impressed by confessionalism, uh, predominantly Sylvia Plath and uh, Anne Sexton. I think we have reached a pivotal moment in our culture right now where confessionalism is really valuable um, to us and understanding our identity and how it relates to things happening to us, like for example, COVID and a lot of the literature and art that's produced from that. But without further ado, I'm going to get into uh, reading my story. Nana, my father's mom, stood before my four foot two figure and tilted her head downwards ever so slightly to make eye contact. Has your mom ever told you about the birds and the bees? It was my 10th birthday. I wouldn't menstruate until my 13th. Well, I've heard the phrase before, but I don't know what it is. Once I had seen a full frontal playboy spread of a brunette lady with big breasts and a curly cloud of pubic hair. I stared at her for a long time and my body tangled. Sex must have been that feeling. She then went on to explain how people who like each other very much sometimes thrust their, their genitals together. I couldn't imagine anyone ever wanting to do that. Your body is yours and only yours. Nobody should be inside you if you don't want them to be. And you should tell someone if that ever happens. And that was the whole conversation. I nodded. The white space was adorned with cabinets and tables. Its ceiling stretched the length of a football field with a square window connecting the walls at its middle. Girls from each unit of the psychiatric hospital would congregate there for breakfast or visits with any of the four psychologists assigned to them. I had a habit of not eating breakfast, but would drink fake orange juice from a plastic cup and stare through the windowed ceiling unless someone felt the need to talk to me. 
It wasn't that I didn't like any of the other girls, although they were insufferable. It's just that trauma bonding isn't an ideal method of developing friendships. The mental health aides or glorified babysitters walked us back to our units after stomachs were full of jam, fruit toast, and sugary cereal. Each day started at 8 a.m. and the girls had a choice to either shower or sleep and until breakfast was made available. Light hardly pushed through the bedroom windows or even the unit living room space for they had been spray painted white, two separate worlds coexisting by a sheaf of laminated glass. 11 a.m. was group therapy, lunch at noon, more therapy, dinner at five, more therapy. The babysitters were lazy and frequently gave up the final therapy session in place of art or movie. I preferred reading, a, reading alone in my room when the sitters gifted us with personal space, but I'd curl myself up against its doorframe otherwise. We saw a psychiatrist at 10. Mine can never recall who I was. The portly dark man with the sludgy accent stared at his computer screen more than my eyes during our interactions. He didn't know how to talk to me, so he must have been searching for a way how. I told this to my therapist and she laughed a passive laugh that showed me I wasn't the first. Mm. The whole situation of the psychiatrist, the therapist, lazy babysitters, and equally passive windows were a testament to my life and I couldn't have felt more sick about it. Therapy sessions were similar to visits with the psychiatrist in the way we talked in circles and never came to a resolution. I supplied answers if it meant everyone would stop attempting to dig into my skin in search of feasible solutions to a chemical and familial imbalance. Suicide had convinced me that it would be waiting beyond the gates of the ward anyhow. So you hate your mom. I wouldn't necessarily say that. Scribble, scribble. Then what about the relationship triggers you? I never said it did. Scribble, scribble. Then who are you trying to escape? Myself, I think. Scribble, scribble. Okay, let's backtrack. Can you tell me about some events that could have led you to this decision? I thought that was a strange way to ask about my trauma. Because you see, most people with your condition have usually suffered from extensive sexual or physical abuse. I just want to understand you better. The bench creaked as I readjusted my body further from her. There's your answer then. He walked back to the unit in silence. The word blankets and pillows were perfumed with chemicals. At least that's what it smelled like. Guilt settled in my bones as I folded myself between the sheet and powdered blue blanket. People in my life never talked about anything of significance regarding emotions. They were too gooey a texture to spit into another person. The ideal of being a productive member of society held us together by a thin strand of perfectionism in which kills mother slowly and forced me into confronting death as an old friend. And I am skipping a little section because I, it's, it can be very triggering. Beach day, Nanda's voice poked the silence of sleep from my eardrums. I fell asleep only five minutes earlier, but that should have been more than enough time to sit on the beach for five hours, get bored and walk the boardwalk before we left, as was tradition. Glass windows, windowed doors separated the living room space into two halves. We slept on the less occupied of the two, the one nearest the front of the helm. Two beige couches occupied the space and one of which folded into a mattress large enough to hold both my sister and I. I massaged the morning light into my eyes while stretching the sleep baked limbs beneath the floral comforter. Sister uncoiled mm -hmm. herself from the fetal position. She slept like that well into her teen years. And that's all. Wow, that was really great. One of the comments made um, was from Dr. Vanderland, who said that you use a, ni a nice use of theory. And I agree with that. As a theory junkie, I was so pleased to see that you talked about that so much in your critical introduction, but also here in your presentation. Um, I think sometimes theory is overlooked, especially as it, in its relationship to creative writing. Um, uh, cause I, I feel sometimes that, that creative writers often think, oh, that's just for, um, uh, for literary theory people. But I think that it definitely applies to the way that we understand how we write. So excellent work. Um, Dr. Taylor agrees, as does uh, Courtney. Oh, I know, I can't wait to see this final project as well. 
Um, and Dr. Go also said impressive, and I couldn't agree more. Very, very good work. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Next up, we have uh, Megan Organis. So let's see, let's pull her up. Hello, Megan. Hello. How are you? I'm doing just fine, you? It, good, good. Is your cat leaving your tree alone? <laughs> she is, yeah, actually, she's sleeping. We've been talking about that. That's good. Mine, mine's asleep too, or at least pretending to be. So um, what do you have for us today? I have a piece of creative fiction that I'll read a little bit of and talk a little bit about uh, the process of doing research for it. Yeah, and I know that one of the things that you really enjoy doing is dealing with fables and myth and, and those things, and that's right after my own heart as well. I love uh, the idea of because there's no real original stories anymore, right? They're all sort of built on each other and lean into each other. So um, I can't wait to hear what you have to say today. So I'm gonna disappear and let you do that. All right, so I am a creative writing major and I am uh, doing a piece in that vein. As Dr. Bersonic mentioned, um, I do love fairy tales, myths and fables. Um, those are like the first thing I can remember ever really reading. I used to have this, this huge book of like grim fairy tales from my grandmother, which looking back on, I mean, they weren't very that child friendly, but I did enjoy those a lot. I decided to do something kind of in that vein um, at the end of my project. Um, I did do quite a bit of research for this, which I think helped me as a writer because I kind of hate doing research. But um, for this one, I read a lot of old fairy tales and there were a lot of things that I found that I wasn't expecting to find. Um, I'll share some of those with you now. Um, so what surprised me the more I read, like their fairy tales are very short, you can read a lot of them and they get very repetitive after a while. Um, the use of names really surprised me. They came up a lot. There are almost no characters with names in fairy tales or any kind of myths really. Uh, they're usually just the wife, the mother, the king, the witch, anything which makes it whenever there is a name, it jumps out a lot. And that's a very big difference from like modern retellings of you know myths and fables. So much emphasis is put on names now, which is, I just think it's interesting. Um, the dialogue too, which I think surprised me the most, You there's almost no dialogue. Um, it's usually told through like a passive voice in the past tense. Compared to modern writing, there's so much dialogue. Um, but so for this project, I wanted to write like a fairy tale of my own. And I'm not really adapting anything in particular, but having read back over a bunch, I just, there's a lot of common themes that pop up. And I wanted to kind of like combine those into something new. But like Dr. Personic said, nothing is ever new. This is just um, little bits and pieces put together that I found. Um, but I did want it to feel more like an older fairy tale because I do like the way those sound they're written and they have kind of like a pessimistic quality to them that makes them feel more realistic than like Disney fairy tales which always end happily um, but that being said there's a lot of problematic elements to the old myths and fables you know they're usually trying to teach a message which is you know kind of damaging when you look back on it a lot of them are just like ah, listen to your husband don't do this don't do that don't think for yourself um they're they're really bad sometimes but um i did kind of want to poke fun at that but also do something in that same vein so with that being said i guess i'll read you guys the first uh, little bit of my piece Once there was a princess, charming in all the right ways, bold in none of the wrong ones. She was the jewel of her father's kingdom, having grown before his subjects, adoring eyes from a shy round thing hiding behind her mother's chair to a young woman whose beauty became a thing of legend. Her eyes were as blue as a mountain spring into the depths of which many a young suitor would gladly fling themselves. Her laugh could melt a snowflake with its warmth and her auburn hair, it was said, could make even the most brilliant of harvest leaves wither early in shame. All this was true, as much as such things can be said to be true, but of all that was said of her, only one needed to be. She was beautiful enough to have charmed the prince. 
Now, the prince had a name, as most do, but this mattered so little few bothered to use it. He was not just the prince, he was the prince, son of the richest king in the noble land. All other distinctions, even his name, paled in comparison to this. The princess had a name, too, but hers did matter. For though Bernice was more beautiful than others the prince might have sought to court, though her parents' kingdom was both large and rich enough that its peasants had little trouble filling the castle's larder, even these distinctions were not necessarily enough when vying for the prince's attention. Not that Bernice needed to vie for it any longer. She already had it, or everyone seemed to think she did, and this was just as good. It was good enough for the prince, who, after visiting the court of Bernice's father with his own, had been impressed enough to make a return journey to call on her properly. They walked together in the castle gardens, and although her maids and his advisors walked a few paces behind them, okay, slow down too much. Uh, walked a few paces behind them, it seemed to Bernice that they were the only two in the world. They dined, and although they sat at opposite ends of the table as courtesy demanded, Bernice watched his movements and mirrored them, so that when he laughed, she could laugh and feel as if he was by her side. Bernice was not the only one taken in by her suitor. Her mother deemed him most cur courteous and a wise match. This was as much of an opinion as the queen was expected to have on the matter, but it pleased Bernice to hear. Her father took the prince hunting in the forest and was happy to report him as good with a bow as he was with a sword. They returned with a boar and a pair of robe off his proof. So after many nights of feasting, it was decided that the princess and her entourage would accompany the prince back to his kingdom, where she would be presented to his father for approval. Bernice brought with her two dozen of her father's knights for protection and two maid servants to attend her needs. She also brought the best of her belongings. Vanity, she had long ago accepted, was always going to be one of her flaws, and if it was her beauty that had brought her into the graces of the prince, she saw no need to diminish it by suddenly turning modest. So she packed away all her favorite rings and necklaces, the dark blue riding dress with the gold embroidery at the hem and the sleeves, and her fur-lined cloak should the nights turn cold, and any other finery that caught her eyes. All this she packed away on top of the lavender gown she would wear when she was received by the prince's father. The journey to the prince's castle would be a long one, for his father's kingdom lay in a region of the country where the river meets the sea and all was fair in weather and trade. Bernice spent most of the journey in her carriage with her handmaids, but these were rather droll company, preferring their own language of furtive glances and first lips to communication of any kind with their lady. So Bernice had to content herself with watching the trees slide past her narrow window and straining her neck to catch a glimpse of the prince riding on his horse down the procession. The sunlight glinted off the polished gold of the horse's bridle, but not quite so magnificently as it did off of his hair or his perfect skin. He was healthy and alive, and if all went well, he would be hers. She said as much to her maids. My lady is most fortunate, one had replied without glancing up from her stitch work, and the other had droned, most fortunate. Bernice wished then she had picked her companions as carefully as she had picked her clothing. But then she had seemed to be had even more maids at her disposal than she had fine things to wear. At least one dress stood out from the other. Her maid's personalities were lost to her in a sea of placating smiles and well wishes. As they traveled, they passed many small villages, with which Bernice, having never been so far beyond the castle's walls, were only ever known to her by name. The people there knew her name, though, and as the entourage passed by, the peasants would come out of their cottages and their fields to line the roads and cheer and throw flowers. It was not so long, though, before the villages they came upon were less familiar, the villagers less inclined to theatrics than the ones closer to the heart of the kingdom. The landscape became much changed as well, until one afternoon, Bernice woke from a nap to find they had entered a forest of unfamiliar trees, the scent of which stung her nose. These were taller and darker than any trees she had seen near the castle, and grew so densely the only evidence of sunlight was a faint purple haze that leaked like liquid between their tight branches. They had no leaves but for soft, needle-like protuberances, and these left a tacky resin on her hand when she reached out through the carriage window to touch them. It took a good half-hour scrubbing on her handmaid's part to remove the resin. Much less time than that, Bernice decided this was not a forest to her liking. She deemed it an evil place and spent the remainder of their passage through it with her curtains drawn. If the prince was at all perturbed by their surroundings, he did not stay, but then he had made trips through this place before, and surely others even more fantastic. He assured the princess they would not be in the forest much longer, and having ridden some ways ahead, told her of a grassy glen he had found some ways from the forest edge. It was here he commanded the entourage to stop and make camp for the night. And that is where I will stop too.
Oh, I really love that. I think um, not a forest of her liking would make a great title for something that you might do in the future. That is interesting, yeah. Yeah, so I really love fable and myth and those are usually the things that we first hear when we're kids, you know, the mother goose rhymes, stories that are moral tales. Yeah. Um, and I think we spend the rest of our lives rewriting those and, and rethinking them, or at least we should if we're introspective people. Um, so awesome job. I can't wait to read the rest of it. I feel like the audience should be jealous because I'll get to read the whole thing. Um, when you turn in your work next week. So thank you very much, Megan. Thank you. Um, let's see, we have another Megan coming up. Let me work my magic. Hello, Megan. Hi. Hi. How are you today? I'm well, how are you? Uh, great. Um, so I am looking forward to your confessional poetry. I know that we had a pretty intense conversation one day about the yeah. <laughs> about the um the status of confessional poetry in um in in the 21st century and um i'm interested to hear what you have to say awesome thank you yes all right so hello to everyone uh those professors who um, watching that don't know me, I am a literature and creative writing major. Um, for my capstone project, I wrote a chapbook of confessional poetry called The Rings Around the Forest. Um, so for my thesis, I knew I wanted to do something that did not feel like a task, essentially. I wanted to do something that um, represented my voice, my persona that I have created for myself as a young woman writer of creative nonfiction. Um, so throughout my studies at Cal, I have devoted almost every research or response paper to the work of a female author or poet, um, or I have written rather aggressively about the patriarchy in some form or another. Um, so part of me is a little angry that I did not minor in women's studies, but it's almost like um, I didn't need to because that's what my interest geared towards. Um, throughout every class, whether it was for creative writing or even a journalism course I took with Dr. Carlisle last semester. Um, I wrote an article about period poverty at Cal U and I have never put so much effort into a journalism piece until it came to that story um, without even realizing it because that is just, it's just something that I am truly passionate about. Um, so I find it rather exhausting to be a female in the 21st century. Um, we've reached mm -hmm. a time period where the world tells us that we can be anything we want, but we never wanted to be followed through the aisles of Walmart or sexually assaulted at work and school and in our, in our own bedrooms or denigrated for trying to speak the truth about it um, in that process of striving for success and acknowledgement. Um, and I just think it's especially important for anyone to seek some dimension of solace or normalcy, I guess, um, with these kind of experiences, um, which I believe confessional poetry to be the perfect way of doing so in terms of writing. Um, so Poetry Foundation uh, defines confessional poetry as per the poetry of the personal or the I. Um, and it was emerging style of autobiographical writing that really flourished in the 1950s and early 1960s. Um, so some of the more renowned writers of the style were Sylvia Plath, obviously, um, Robert Lau, W.D. Snodgrass, and my all-time favorite, Anne Sexton. Um, I remember reading Sylvia Plath for the first time, it was Lady Lazarus, of course, um, and it was in Professor McVeigh's Intro to Poetry class. Um, I remember talking about the symbolism and the allegorical components of the poem relating to suicide and her father, but I just remember being more engulfed um, with the masculine connotations of her words and like the colloquial language that she used to convey these deeper messages that was so effective and bone chilling without making it sound ostentatious or just plain old pretentious, I guess. Um, I remember using the word forsooth in Dr. Downey's British literature 
one class in one of her papers. And she was just, she was not having it. And I still laugh about it to this day because that's the kind of writer that I thought I needed to be. Um, and Professor McVeigh also had similar words with me um, about my writing. And I really can't thank either of them enough for being honest with me because who knows what my voice would sound like if nobody had stopped me back then. Um, but that's what these confessional poets did. They used more of an informal vocabulary and speech rhythms and used images that reflected these um, psychological experiences of trauma and depression and death. And this is ultimately the essence of my chapbook. Um, each of my poems are crafted in the form of a first person narrative. I wanted to focus on the storytelling element um, on writing it all out, like this immense exhale of spoiled guilt and shame, um, while also experimenting with slant rhymes and trying to focus on the specific images I see, um, rather than feelings, I guess. Um, trying not to focus on being insightful, but more of like deconstructing the situation. Um, I don't know if I ever would have found the confidence to write something on this personal of a level um, of this kind of traumatic of experience, um, especially for my friends, my colleagues, my community to read and critique openly. But I really needed that challenge and to kind of push myself through a more structural healing process, I guess I'll call it. Um, I find that confessional poetry also has therapeutic measures to it, obviously, um, when you're focusing on the self um, for me, there's this like intense sense of liberation when writing through a traumatic experience. Um, this was a subject that I didn't even think that I was ready to tackle yet, but I was experiencing the worst, almost painful writer's block that I'd ever personally experienced because I could literally not think of anything else to write or even think about. So I felt like I almost didn't really have a choice. Like my mind was saying, we need to bring this to the surface or we're just going to keep drowning. So what better way to do that than writing a collection of poetry for my capstone, um, especially knowing that it has internal and external purposes once completed. So the ultimate goal of this chapbook is to reach publication, um, hopefully through an independent publisher. Um, so I didn't really have a title for my piece um, that I'd been thinking of. The Rings Around the Forest kind of just came to me one night when I was trying to sleep, uh, thinking of everything I had to get done and that where I'm going to get the energy to do that. Um, and I just kind of kept thinking of how all I wanted to do was be in the woods, be in nature. I can't go very long, meaning like a day or two without being in nature and not just being in my backyard or at the park. Um, yeah, I need to be out there, be in there, be breathing it, living it. Um, but I think of the rings as the cycles and the seasons and the energy of the circuits that shape me, um, which includes all of the bad, all of the trauma that lingers above um, and the timelessness of feeling and experiencing and overcoming and just being resilient, I guess. Um, the voice of womanhood is an essential asset to the literary market and that it just seems to not be to want to be understood as much as it wants to be heard simply. Um, so if I never became acclimated with these authors and poets, well, one, I'd probably be graduated by now, but I definitely would not have the knowledge and exposure to the array of literature that I do now. Um, Dr. Downey introduced me to one of my favorite, now favorite British women writers, Doris Lessing, and uh, Dr. Vanderlyn, of course, in her 20th century American literature class where we read The Yellow Wallpaper by Charlotte Perkins Gilman. And in her survey of American women writers class, we read novels by Willa Cather and Edith Wharton and Kate Chopin. And even in classes like Dr. Murray's American literature genres, uh, which was based on humor and satire, um, not only did he introduce me to one of my favorites, Dorothy Parker, but it felt like fate when he assigned me my response paper for the day we were reading this essay by uh, Christopher Hitchens called Why Women Aren't Funny, um, because I was enraged that people actually have this strong of an opinion about women in the year 2007 and for him to write it for this 
famous magazine, um, it's just kind of absurd to me. Um, but I'm just, yeah, I'm glad I had that opportunity again to write about something that I'm almost embarrassingly passionate about at this point. Um, but now I am going to read a few poems for you. I hope I have enough time. Um, so the first one is called, it's the first poem of my chapbook. It's called Anniversary of a Rotten Tomato. Um, Grease boy left his scum on my bed, sticky and tenacious, waiting for me to give up and wash the sheets. I waved to my neighbors like I've never watched a porno where the girl is asleep. Yes, I believe in self-respect or whatever the hell they're calling it these days, but teach me how to shut my eyes when all I remember is the smell of my dog on the closet floor. Look at him now, paving roads with the thieves who bragged about the pillows they stole from dreamers like me. I curse the ceiling for keeping a secret. I hold my head up and swallow hard, real hard after taking a bite. And I wait, and I wonder when and if and why. And oh, how thoughtful of him to acknowledge the day as if he's been dying to send me the truth with a rose and a noose. My breath wraps me tight around these lines he drew just for me. Happy anniversary, my rotten tomato. Um, this next poem's called Consorting with Pine. Um, it's actually a spinoff, I'll call it, of one of Anne Sexton's poems called Consorting with Angels. Um, goes, I am tired of being a woman, <clears throat> tired of the dichotomy between round and flat, tired of the creases and the folds and being told the better half of me is never growing back. I wrap my fragments, my flesh, foolishly around the center of this cell, pretend I am per perennial and can tell my mother anything. The day I gain my powers, mother cut her wrists. She froze like clumps of dirt in a pail of winter flowers, begging me not to grow. This was an anomaly, possibly my fault. I assumed she thought I flipped a switch on the wall of my fallopian tunnels or cheated in the race to reach the crimson tide before my older sister. I blame everything on the moon and the way she likes to wander. Through the trail, she leaves me stranded, shouting, don't look over your shoulder. I'm tired of forcing myself to bring the roses back to life, tired of lying to the trees, I promised I was capable of keeping us both alive, that I was more than ink on paper, ink on concrete, covered in skin. But I feel nothing more than my toes in this cold soil. I have been sundered and peeled away. I am no more a woman than this one-eyed open monster is a god that sleeps on the floor of my closet. Final poem, I'll try to wrap it up. Um, it's called Falling. Um, in love with myself, electric and blue and jaded, self-flooded but able and not, but to know me is to gamble me like that dream I once had or still having, that blue, placid, like the grave behind every cloud. I succumb to its cycles, spit it out when I'm done like an unwanted child. Falling in love with myself, my liquid, my lines, my guilt, forming rings around the forest. I go there, I am my own shovel. Find the bindings, burn it all down just for the view the endorphin, the science of it all, and to hold tight the mask of my father's racism served with rice and broccolini on pigskin Sundays. Falling in love with myself is a cave I never would have found if instead the waters whispered and my mother never drowned. It's the tail, the gunshot of freedom I asked the fat man to keep. Oh, how lucky am I to fall in love with myself just when the blue unfolds into dusk and captures me. Thank you so much. Excellent. Um, I rambled a lot. I apologize for that. <laughs> no, I, I appreciated that. And I think that, um, again, we've talked about this before. I can think of no time like now uh, for Kentucky to, I think it's so important in these times, to have the voice of the eye, to have that experience. And what a, a better in poetry for that experience. Um, you do have some comments here. Dr. Vanderlein said she really loved that. Really <laughs> um, and some comments. And so thank you. Thanks, guys. You did a really good job. I know you this was hard. Yeah. You did it. You did it. So I yes. cut the best when you tune in next week. Thank you. Okay. Hey, how are you? 
Good. How are you? Excellent. So I know that you've been working on this project. It's actually a novel, right? Yeah. Um, for quite some time. And uh, I think you should let it speak for itself. So I'm going to go and let, uh, are you going to, for you to talk about the critical introduction and read us a piece? Okay. Um, I'm an English major with a concentration in creative writing. I wrote a book called Born This Way. I've been working on this for, I want to say about a year, maybe two years. At first it started out as a short story, but then I decided to uh, extend it to see how my characters and the storyline would evolve into something bigger. And one of, the th one of the things that I hope to accomplish with my capstone is that I want members of the LGBTQ community to realize that they're not alone and that there are, are people out there who are willing to fight for those in the LGBT community that are either afraid to express themselves or to have their, their voice heard. Um, I, chose to write, I chose to write about um, the LGBTQ community because um, some people consider it a sin of, against God or to, or it's to some people, unfortunately, they think being gay is a sickness. So I just I wrote I wrote a little bit about what the LGBTQ community might go through e either in their own community or within their own families behind closed doors. Uh, some of the methods that I used was um, I did a little research, but mostly. For, for my project for um I Google searched on different locations in Beverly Hills, California, because in my book, uh, one of the locations is in Beverly Hills where my main characters move to Beverly Hills so they could be close to the college that they will attend after graduating high school. Uh, I wrote Born This Way in first person point of view in the point of view of my one of my main characters, her name is Lindsay Anderson. So I'll read some of that. This is the preface for my story. My life is pretty much ordinary. I'm a senior in high school and I live with my dad, who's a priest at St. Mary's, which is our local church here in Charleston, South Carolina and my South Carolina. And my mom is a full-time elementary school teacher and a Sunday school teacher on Sundays. My life is pretty normal if you think about it, but I do have a secret. I'm a lesbian and have known for a while. Unfortunately, my parents have no idea. And for now, I want to keep it that way because being a very conservative family, my parents consider being gay or lesbian as a sin and a disgrace to God. Anyway, life is great, but unfortunately, it always comes tumbling down because keeping a secret like mine is extremely difficult, especially when I start to spend a lot of time with the girl in school and my parents start to notice and start asking questions. What do I tell them? I'm dating the new girl? Hell no. Instead, I lie and say we're in the same study group. This works for a while, but nothing lasts forever, unfortunately. Anyway, the story that I'm about to tell you will explain what I went through while being a lesbian in secret and how I came out of the closet and everything that happened after that. But for now, let me explain what happened before and then I'll tell you the after. And believe me, it's one hell of a story. <clears throat> Chapter one. Jason's totally into you, my best friend Sasha was saying as her and I headed to English class together. You should go out with him. He's not my type, I said with a shrug. At least give him a chance, Sasha begged as we took our seats at the front of the classroom. Yesterday, Jason was telling me during biology that he has a huge crush on you and that he was thinking about asking you to prom. Thanks, but I prefer to find my own date to prom, I said. Maybe you should go to prom with Jason. You and I both know that you've had a crush on him since freshman year. Sasha blushed, but before she could argue, class had started, and so she dropped the subject for now, for now anyway. As I opened my notebook to a clean page, I noticed a girl sitting on my other side that I've never seen before, and I decided to introduce myself. Excuse me, I said, tapping her on the shoulder. Are you new in town? The girl turned and smiled. My family and I just moved to Manhattan, she answered. From Manhattan, she answered. 
My parents are clothed clothing designers who wanted to spread their business here to Charleston. That's so cool, I said with a smile. My name's Lindsay, by the way, and welcome to Charleston High. Nice to meet you, the girl said as she took as we shook hands. I'm Sam, and thank you for making me feel welcome. Maybe I can show you around town sometime, I said. You should definitely check out the aquarium. It's definitely something to see. That would be great, Sam said, smiling shyly. I would love to get more familiar with the city. We should definitely hang out sometime. After that, we quickly exchanged numbers before Miss, Miss Harrison entered the room. And when the day finally ended, Sasha was back back at it again, trying to convince me to go out with Jason. At least promise you'll think about it, she was saying as we headed for our, our cars. Fine, I said, just to shut her up. But I'm not making any promises. After that, I got into my car and headed for home. When I finally walked through the door of our townhouse, my parents were sitting in the living room and whispering to each other. What's going on? I asked as I left my backpack by the stairs. A family just moved into the unit next door, my dad answered, as if this explained everything. So, I asked with a shrug. We got, we got new neighbors. What's the big deal? They're homosexuals, my mom said in dis disgust. They're a, a disgrace to God. I suppressed the urge to roll my eyes. I've heard my dad preach about homosexuality being a sin ever since I could walk, and it was starting to get irritating. And so I quickly grabbed my backpack and made an excuse of having a lot of homework and escaped to my room. After I shut my door behind me, I checked, the I checked my phone and saw I had one text message from Sam. Sam, you, feel you free after school tomorrow? Me, yes, why? Sam, I was thinking maybe you could show me around the city. Me, I'd love to. Sam, great, can't wait. I smiled to myself as I put my phone away and started on my homework. And when I was done, it was almost dinner time, but I didn't feel like eating because I didn't feel like hearing my my parents diss the neighbors and go on about people like them should be allowed on God's earth. Instead, I stayed in my room listening to music until my mom knocked on my door. What? I asked, turning down my music until it was background noise. I called you twice for dinner, my mom said. I'm not hungry, I said, and looked up at the ceiling, hoping she would leave me alone, but no such luck. You feeling okay? She asked, coming over to sit on my bed to feel my forehead. You're not sick, are you? I'm fine, I muttered, shoving her hand away. I just don't want to hear dad dissing the neighbors. Lindsay, you know you we feel Lindsay, you know how we feel about their kind of people, my mom said. What they are is a sin. This time I did roll my eyes, and I didn't try to hide it either. This turned me a don't you disrespect me look for my parent, mom. And I just sighed and turned my back to her. God also said to love thy neighbor as yourself, I said, not being able to help myself by quoting the Bible. Does that mean anything to you? Male and female complete God's image on earth, my mom said, exasperated. Now come down to dinner. After that, she left my room, and I was finally alone with my thoughts. And eventually, I headed down to dinner, where my parents were already eating in comfortable silence. How's school? My dad asked as I sat down to fill my plate. Good, I answered with a shrug, and before he could ask any more questions, I took a bite of mashed potatoes so that I was unable to talk. After I was finished, I cleaned my place at the table and headed back up to my room to get ready for bed. As I was getting under my covers, I overheard my parents whispering downstairs in the, in the living room, and so tiptoed to my open door so I could hear what they were saying. I don't know what's gotten into her, my mom said, and I knew what they were talking about. It's probably just stress, my dad said. It's Lindsay's senior year, and she probably has a lot on her plate right now. But the way she went on about the neighbors being good people made me a little worried, my mom said with a sigh. Shouldn't we talk to someone about it? We'll let it go for now, my dad answered. In the meantime, we should get some rest. After that, I heard my parents go into their room on the first floor. And for a while, I just sat there on the floor near my bedroom door and contemplated on what I just overheard. And I immediately made up my mind that as soon as I graduated, I was going to get the hell out of here so I wouldn't have to put up with my parents' crap. Wow, that's off to a great start. How much do you have written so far? Uh, it's basically done. I think it's like 200 plus pages, I think, give wow. or take. Yeah. That's awesome. 
Um, and Dr. Vanderland uh, says that she loves your one-liners, <laughs> uh, like the suppress the urge to roll my eyes. <laughs> That's a good one. Um, thank you so much for this. You're welcome. Um, and we have one more presentation left. Brent. Hello. How are you? Oh, just really nervous. Oh, you'll be great. <laughs> you'll be great. So I know that when you first started working on this project, you were very interested in gonzo journalism and that whole style of uh, observation and reflection. And so what? tell us just a little bit about where you went with it. So initially I thought about doing more of a literary research project into Hunter S. Thompson, the kind of founder of gonzo journalism. Uh, he wrote Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas, among other pieces. Um, that's just what he's mainly known for. Um, but his kind of work is the, one of the most prominent and first instances of a journalist kind of inserting themselves into their stories and using um, kind of creative writing to boost their journalism, as opposed to just having cut and dry the news. And that um, that really interested me. Uh, it really piqued my interest and made me um, uh, passionate about that genre. Um, but then I realized that this project is kind of like my one chance to show off what I want to do. And Absolutely. so I changed it completely. Uh, after I submitted my uh, proposal for the project, I decided, you know what? I've done research on people and them doing things my whole life. Why not do stuff for myself? Like, why not do make a project of what I want to do? And so I changed it into a sort of collection of stories and poems and things that I made that I just kind of wanted to make. <laughs> Yes, and I'm glad that so many of you in this class made that decision to kind of do uh, what you've always wanted to do or what you're passionate about. So I'm excited about that. I'm going to let you speak, though. I'm going to get off your screen and let you have. All right. Thank you. I'd like to preface this uh, whole uh, talk or speech or whatever by thanking a few people. Uh, first and foremost, Dr. Carlisle and Dr. Go for molding me into the journalist that I am at the moment. Without those two professors, I definitely wouldn't have the writing ability that I do today. Dr. House for showing me creativity and helping me open up with my writing and you know figure out that I don't want to do just news things. I kind of want to put my own spin on it and maybe take after Hunter S. Thompson. Um, Dr. Murray and Dr. Taylor as well uh, for showing me what passion in education looks like um, throughout high school and stuff like that. I barely had any teachers that, you know, would uh, I, I would legitimately say are passionate about their subjects and their students and the things that they're teaching to them. So I'm grateful for all of you. Um, I'd, I'd describe myself as a blunt person. Any of you professors or any of the classmates that have been around me would probably agree with that. But I think so much of my work throughout high school and college has been for other people, you know, getting assignments that other people give to me that I'm not particularly interested in. Maybe I can twist it one way or another that I'm really excited about it, but usually that's not the case. I find it very difficult to put my heart into something that I don't care about. And the majority of my writing career has just been that, you know, some things that I'm not particularly interested in. And it's hard to, you know, put 100% into that. With the capstone project here, I'm trying to do something entirely for myself, like I said. Like, I'm trying to put my heart out, put my heart uh, on my sleeve and uh, show what I'm capable of that I and, you know, just as talented as some of these other phenomenal students that I uh, take classes with um, that are extremely talented and that push me to be a better writer because I, I see them as kind of the golden standard. Um, like I said, I initially wanted the project to be that research thing, but I decided, you know what, I'm, I'm doing this for me. You know, it's my one chance to show off and flex my creative writing muscles <laughs> for a change. And I'm not going to pass that up. Um, I, I do wish that I took more creative writing classes uh, well at Cal. Um, the opportunity is still there. I still do have a few semesters left. 
but I feel like my career here has been very journalism heavy, but I do very much enjoy the creative side as well. Um, I definitely knew about getting into uh, gonzo journalism and this whole sort of genre. When I first read uh, the article Song of the Sausage Creature by Hunter S. Thompson, it's a very short article about Hunt, the author, uh, Hunter S. Thompson, uh, riding a Ducati back in, I think, the 80s or 90s. Um, he gets a Ducati for a magazine that he's writing for, and he rides it, and just the, the imagery in it was something like I've never seen before from journalism. Um, it, it told almost a, a story that I could visualize in my mind, not in a not in a factual way where this happened, then this happened, then this happened, but really exploring the creative aspects of um, what he was doing and being into vehicles and cars and stuff, as most of you would probably know myself, I, that really spoke to me and it was really something that I grew fond of. And I tend to read that article probably about once a month at this point, just to kind of give myself a little energy boost or a little boost of inspiration. Um, so I am for this going to be reading a poem that I wrote, which if it, most of you probably know me, um, is not my strong suit. So please bear with me on that. And I am going to be reading a short story, which I think is much stronger, but I will let you all be the, um, decision makers about that. Uh, my poem is called Coaster. Close your eyes, old towers of wood and steel below you, ascending into the heavens, only birds in sight. Sunbeams shower the tops of nearby buildings, nowhere to run. Errant cars of strangers waiting for the top. Recompense with your fear. I will now be switching to the short story, which I think is stronger, honestly. It's called 105. I remember the first time that I went over 100 miles an hour. The garage door made, makes a lot of noise. I'm not sure if they all do that or if we just bought a cheap one, but it groans and squeaks and whirs to life the instant I press the clicker. I toss my bag into the trunk of the pearl white Subaru Legacy and wince as I hear my drinks inside clash with the soccer cleats. The instant I turn the key, the radio starts blasting AJR at a volume that is nowhere near okay at six in the morning. The touchscreen freezes and my ears continue to be violated by the audio. Eventually I press the right buttons because my music finally recedes to a more reasonable volume and I back out of the garage. Mom's car comes with 170 horsepower. No one can consider it to be a race car, except for a 17-year-old pimple-faced teenager. When you're 17, any car feels fast. Anything with four wheels and an engine may as well be a Formula One car, and you may as well be Lewis Hamilton. In my mind, the gas pedal only had two positions, all the way up and all the way down. Unless I was facing an obstacle that the car wouldn't be able to plow through, the pedal stayed down. Highways are boring with slow cars, so I take the scenic route to practice. Vanceville Road goes all the way to the field, a long, narrow straightaway that goes on for about a mile that leads into another mile or two of twisting roads going around the hills near the local mine. The car complains when it gets driven any like anything but a family sedan. The transmission whines under acceleration, the engine takes any release of the gas pedal as an invitation to lose all of its speed, and the tires squeal and scream around any corner that's twisty enough to remind me of a racetrack that I've only seen in video games. I don't care about any of this. And the moment that the white sedan rounds the corner onto the straightaway, I stomp the gas pedal to the floor. The car groans, but starts to pick up speed. I flick the high beams on and the road in front of me becomes a runway. The suspension soaks up the humps in the road as gravity helps the seriously overweight sedan stay planted to the asphalt. My foot has been pushed to the floor for the past 30 seconds and it's starting to show. The fence posts lining the sides of the road start to blur together in my periphery. The humps in the road come more frequently. Out of curiosity, I glance at the speedometer with my first three digit number staring back at me. 100, 101, I can't look away. 102, 103, 104, just a little bit faster. 105, my eyes flick up for a fraction of a second only to be met with another set of eyes staring back at me. Two amber orbs reflecting towards me, standing feet above the tarmac. 
My right foot instinctually shifts to the brake pedal, and I nearly kick that rubber square in the footwell through the floor. The car hates going fast, but it certainly doesn't complain about slowing down. The tires let out a spine spine chilling screech, and the brakes nearly lock. The clunking of the ABS preventing mom's car and I from becoming a giant metal meat tenderizer. My hands feel like they're going to rip the steering wheel right out of the car, and all the muscles in my arms are screaming for me to let go. The sedan bucks to a stop, and the deer just stares at me. A doe with a face not dissimilar to some of the dogs I've seen just stares at the one and a half ton box of steel that almost became its coffin. My heart feels like it wants to leap from my chest and get out of the car while it still can. My eyes are glued open. I don't remember breathing this fast, but I can't calm myself down. The deer turns to the field near my side of the road and hops over the electric cattle fence. I watch her hop through the grass on my right, unable to focus on anything else. A strange smell that I now know is overheated brakes fills my nostrils. I blink for the first time in nearly two minutes, and as my eyes begin to water, I muster up the bravery to press a toe back onto the gas pedal, spending the rest of the drive in terrified silence. That's all I got. Thank you. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you so, so much, Brent, for reading for us today and talking to us about this process that you've gone through, um, the, not just this semester, but in your education. So awesome. I'm going to bring everybody else on. So turn your cameras back on, please. So you're not just a little circle. Um, let's see, who did I miss? Did I get everybody? Oh, I'm missing somebody. Brent. One, two, three, four, five. I can't count the six today. So um, there's tons and tons of comments in the comments section um, for all of you. Some of them were coming in um, a little delayed because that's. Um, but you all have done an absolutely fantastic job this semester and thank you so much for being prepared and um, for showing us your absolute um, best work. Also, um, I feel like, you know, I'm sort of a midwife in a sense in that all these other professors you've had over the semesters um, have prepared you for this moment and that you have prepared um, yourself for this moment. And I'm just kind of here saying, here's the space, um, here's the time, um, and here's the sort of pat on the back and you got it uh, moment. Like that's been my role um, this semester. So excellent, excellent work, everybody. And uh, that concludes our presentations. Um, for English 499 for this semester. Thank you to everybody um, who joined us on YouTube and on Facebook. This, pre this presentation day, as well as Tuesdays, will be available on YouTube. You just follow the link that you went to to watch. Um, there might be a delay for today's because uh, YouTube holds them for a little while and then releases them. So feel free to go back and rewatch. Thank you all so very much. Great semester, everybody. I'll see everyone somewhere else. Oh, Dr. Carlisle has a comment before we go. That's right. He is uh, very proud of you, as all of us are in the English program. That's it, everybody. Thanks for joining us.